In this video, we will analyze plain vanilla interest rate swaps with respect to their credit risk exposure. Specifically, for interest rate swaps, we will try and build the time profiles for three important metrics. Number one, expected future value. Number two, expected exposure. And number three, potential future exposure. Let's begin by taking the perspective of firm A, which has just now entered into a fixed for floating interest rate swap with firm B. In this interest rate swap, firm A will be periodically paying fixed and receiving floating. So from A's perspective, this is a pair interest rate swap. Okay. What we've done here is that we have drawn out the cash flow diagram for this interest rate swap. And this is again from firm A's perspective. Firm A is receiving floating and it's paying fixed. Exchanges between firm A and firm B, these are happening after every six months. And the maturity of this interest rate swap is 10 years. Okay. Let me position myself as of this point in time. This is time zero. It's that point in time at which this swap has just been initiated. Okay. If this swap were to be equally fair to both parties, then as of this point in time, the value of this swap from A's perspective as of this time zero should be equal to zero. Okay, if it's a fair swap, then as of its inception date, it should start off at a zero value. Okay, now let me do this. Let me take this entire period of 10 years and let me slice it up into a number of smaller periods. Okay, each period will be six months long. My first time slice, it runs at this point in time. Okay, it's that point in time at which the settlement for the first period has just been done. My second time slice runs through at this point in time. It's that point in time at which the settlement for the second period has just been done and so on. My last time slice will be this point in time at which all settlements for this swap have been completed. Okay, now if I were to let's say talk about the value of this swap, again from my perspective, I am firm A, as of this point in time, which is 10 years from today, then because as of this point in time, all settlements have been completed, therefore the value of this swap at this 10 year time point should be equal to zero. Okay. Now, what we need to do next is that we need to figure out what will the future value of our interest rate swap B for each of these time slices. Six months, one year, one year, six months, and so on. If I am positioned as of today, then I will not have this information about what sort of term structure of interest rates will be prevailing at the six month time point, the one year time point, and so on. And this will make the future value of my interest rate swap as of each of these time points, a random variable. Okay, so the future value at this six month time point is a random variable. It will have a probability distribution of its own. The future value as of this one year time point is also a random variable. It will also have a distribution, a probability distribution of its own and so on. Okay. Now, standing as of this point in time, instead of worrying about all these random variables and their associated probability distributions, it's actually much simpler for me if I were to record a single value for each of these future time points. And that single value can be the expected future value for each of these time points. Okay, the expected future value for the six month time point, the expected future value for the one year time point and so on. These will be nothing but the expected values of each of these random variables as read from their respective distributions. Okay, now let's do this. 
Let's try and intuitively build the time profile for expected future value. Okay, basically the expected future value plotted against time. For us to be able to do that, let's start with a very simple and also actually a commonly observed assumption. And this assumption is with respect to the term structure of spot interest rates. Let's assume that the term structure of spot interest rates is an upward sloping term structure, which means that the market is expecting short term interest rates to rise as we keep moving forward in time. Okay. If I were to make this assumption that the spot rate term structure is an upward sloping one, this assumption will imply that the expected size of my floating cash flows will keep increasing as I keep moving to the right in this cash flow diagram that we've drawn. Okay. This means that the expected size of my floating cash flows which appear earlier in the life of this interest rate swap will be smaller as compared to the expected size of my floating cash flows that appear later on in the life of this interest rate swap. Okay, this means that if I were to focus on let's say this time point which is my first settlement then this guy will have a smaller expected value as compared to this guy. This will make the expected sign of my first net cash flow to be negative. The same might hold true for the second period as well. The expected sign of the net cash flow for the second period may also be negative. Eventually, because I know that the size, the expected size of my floating cash flows is increasing as I keep moving to the right, I will reach a settlement period wherein the expected size of my floating cash flow will eventually become greater than my fixed cash flow, right? And therefore, the expected sign of the net cash flow will become positive in some settlement period and it will stay positive till the end of the interest rate swap. Okay, all I'm saying is that because of this assumption which I have made, I will have a bunch of negatives sitting here followed by a bunch of positives. These negatives and the positives which follow these negatives, they will perfectly offset each other thereby making the current value of this interest rate swap equal to a perfect zero. Okay, but if I were to focus on this point in time, the point in time at which a net cash flow with an expected negative sign has just been settled, then at this point in time, the remaining negatives will not perfectly offset the remaining positives. The positives, they will overpower the remaining negatives. And therefore, at this point in time, the expected future value of this interest rate swap will turn out to be a positive number. It will not be equal to zero the way I had here. Okay. Now, if I were to Continue with the same logic, as I keep moving to the right and as I keep dropping out the negatives, the expected future value will keep rising and it will keep rising till that settlement period where I start to drop the positives. Okay, from that settlement period onwards, the expected future value will then start to drop and eventually it will come down to a zero. Okay, so what we've just now reasoned out is that the expected future value of my swap, it will follow a time profile that looks something like this. It starts off at a zero, it finishes off at a zero, in between it rises till that point in time till which we keep dropping the negatives and then it starts to fall when we start to drop off the positives. Okay, this is my time profile for expected future value. Okay, now let's do this. Let's move on to the second metric and that is expected exposure. For that, I'll have to very quickly recap for you this concept of exposure. Exposure is defined to be the loss that I will incur 
if my counterparty were to default and I were to assume a zero recovery. Okay. To keep things simple, let me assume that between me and firm B, there is this single transaction that we've done amongst ourselves. Only one trade that has been done between firm A and firm B. To understand exposure in a mathematical sense, you have to understand this, that the default of firm B will result in a loss for me only in that situation wherein the value of this trade that is done between us has a positive value from my perspective. Okay, I have to be in a winning, in a gaining situation on this trade so that the default of firm B results in a loss for me. Okay, this brings me to the mathematical definition of exposure and it's defined as exposure at any time slice, let's say at this time t, is max of or let's say higher of the future value at that same time slice, comma, zero. This tells me that if the future value is positive, then that future value itself becomes the exposure. If the future value is negative, I will set the exposure to be equal to zero. Okay, now as of this point in time, the value of my interest rate swap is equal to zero. There's no randomness or uncertainty associated with this value. At this point in time, the time at which I am positioned, the exposure which I calculate is called the current exposure. And for this swap, the current exposure is equal to zero. Okay, now for these time points, because the future value is a random variable, exposure, which is defined here to be some kind of a function of this future value will also be a random variable. Okay, and the same way we did for these future values, that means we didn't want to work with these entire distributions. Instead, we recorded a single value for each time point and that was the expected future value. Let's do the same thing for exposure as well. For each of these time points, instead of, you know, working with a random variable, that's the exposure for any given time point, let's just record one single value for each of these time points and let that single value be the expected exposure. Okay, some authors, they refer to this guy to be the expected positive exposure, EPE. Very simple. The expected exposure is nothing but the expected value, I mean the probability weighted average of the exposure at that given time slice. Okay, so for any given time slice, the expected exposure is simply the expected value of the max of future value at that point in time, comma, zero. Now, let's move on to plot the time profile for expected exposure. The first thing for you to note is that like we have in the case of expected future value, the time profile for expected exposure, it will also start off at zero and it will finish off at zero. That's the first thing for you to note. The second thing for you to note is that in between these endpoints, which are time zero and this time 10 years from today, the expected exposure at any given time point will plot above the expected future value at that same time point. Okay, why is that the case? That's because when we calculate expected future value, both the positive future values as well as the negative future values contribute to that expected future value. But when we calculate the expected exposure for that same time point, negative future values, they get replaced by a zero. And therefore, expected exposure for any given time point comes out to be greater than or equal to the expected future value for that same time point. Okay, so my second thing for you to note is that the plot for EE, it'll come out to be placed vertically above the plot for EFV. Okay, the third thing which you have to note is that the vertical distance, the vertical gap between the time profiles of EE and EFV, this vertical gap will depend on the variability, the volatility of future value 
at that particular point in time. Okay, why is that the case? It's because the exposure at any time is a non-linear function of the future value at that time. The same way as the payoff of a call option is of the price of the underlying asset. Okay, because the payoff of a call option is a non-linear function of the price of the underlying asset, that's why the fair value of a call option has this dependence on the volatility of the underlying asset. The same rule tells us that the expected exposure at any given time should depend on the volatility or let's say the, vo the variability of the future value at that point in time. Okay, for this purpose, what I have done here is that I have drawn out the distributions of future value as of these time slices, three and a half years, seven years and eight and a half years. Okay, what we observe here is that as I keep moving to the right, the distribution is becoming narrower. The variability of future value is decreasing. It seems to be quite high here and then it seems to be decreasing as I keep moving to the right. Okay, to understand why this is happening, let's come back to this diagram. If I am positioned as of today, you will agree with me that the uncertainty regarding the valuation of each of these cash flows, this uncertainty should increase as I keep moving to the right. Which means those floating cash flows which are nearer to me, I'll be more confident about those cash flows. There'll be lower uncertainty about those cash flows as compared to those cash flows which are far away from me. This effect is called the diffusion effect. Please note this that for the case of the interest rate swap, the diffusion effect, it gets counterbalanced by another effect which is called the amortization effect. It's also referred to as the roll-off effect. Basically, the amortization effect, it tells me that as I keep moving to the right, the number of cash flows which are still to be settled keeps decreasing. Okay, And because the number of cash flows which are yet to be settled keeps decreasing, the number of cash flows which contribute to the calculation of the future value at any given time slice also keeps decreasing as I keep moving to the right. This is called the amortization effect. Okay, so on one side, the uncertainty of my cash flows keeps increasing as I keep moving to the right. On the other side, the number of cash flows which are included in the calculation of your future value keeps dropping because these cash flows periodically keep getting settled as I keep moving to the right. These are two counterbalancing effects. Okay. Now, please note this, that it's the diffusion effect that actually wins over the amortization effect for the initial time periods, okay, for short time frames. For longer time periods, okay, that means later on in the life of the swap, it's the amortization effect which overpowers over the diffusion effect. Okay, so if I were to take a look at this distribution of future value, by this point in time, it was the diffusion effect that was the overpowering one. That is why this variability is quite high. Okay, this volatility of future value around its expected value is quite high. From this point onwards, it's the amortization effect which has taken over. And that is why the volatility of future value is decreasing and my distribution is becoming narrower and narrower. Okay, now this tells me that mathematically speaking, I can capture these two effects like this. I can say this, that because of the diffusion effect, the expected exposure at any given time should be proportional to, let's say, the square root of time. Okay, this captures the diffusion effect. Same way as if we were to make the IID assumption, the independent and identically distributed assumption, based on that assumption, we know this, that the volatility, it scales with the square root of time. 
It's an analogous way of saying that uncertainty grows with time with respect to the square root of time rule. Okay, that's the same rule that we've adopted here. Now, for the amortization effect, we can say this, that the expected value, its time profile, it's proportional to the residual life of the swap. Because in the amortization effect, we want to capture the number of cash flows which are still left. And that number of cash flows depends on the residual life of the swap. If my maturity is capital T, residual life will be capital T minus lowercase t. Okay, if I were to combine these two effects, the expected exposure at any time t will come out to be a constant, that times the square root of time, that times the residual life of my interest rate swap. And I can use this time profile and plot my time profile like this. Okay, this is exactly this function, constant times square root of t times residual life. Very quickly, put this guy t to be equal to 0, what do you get? You get ee to be equal to 0. Put t equal to capital T, what do you get? ee again to be equal to 0. Okay, so this time profile, it matches at the two endpoints with our intuition and the values which we want. Okay, now you can also do this, you can use simple calculus and prove this that the peak of this expected exposure, it happens at this time t equal to capital T divided by 3. Okay, so for this example, it will happen at this point in time, at one third of the life of the swap, the EE will peak. That's what we are observing here. Okay, then let's do this. Let's finish off this video now by plotting the profile for the PFE, the potential future exposure. The potential future exposure for any given time point will be that value of exposure which leaves off an area underneath the probability distribution that is equal to the level of significance that you've chosen to work with. If let's say you want the PFE at 97.5% confidence, you're looking for that value of the exposure that leaves an area of 2.5% to its right. Okay. This is my EFV, my EE will lie somewhere here to the right of EFV, my PFE will lie further to the right. And again, volatility or variability of my future value will play an important role in terms of determining how far to the right will the PFE be with respect to the EFV and the EE. Okay, the plot for PFE it will look very similar to what we have here and it will look something like this. Okay, it's much further away from the EFV and the EE because we are talking about a point which is the point at which the right tail starts. Okay, but qualitatively the shape is very similar. It's this humped or peaked kind of structure. Okay, this is the PFE of this interest rate swap at 97.5% confidence. Now, before I stop, let me do this. Let me show you how the EE and the PFE will look like for a swap, which is a shorter dated swap. For example, a swap with a maturity of five years. This is how the EE will look like, and this is how the PFE will look like. This tells me that for shorter dated swaps, credit risk exposure is smaller as compared to longer dated swaps. The shape is kind of the same, it's a humped kind of structure and the peak happens at one third of the life of the swap which in this case is 1.67 years. Okay, this video was about understanding the credit risk exposure of interest rate swaps. What we've done is that we have reasoned out how the profiles, the time profiles for the expected future value, the expected exposure and the potential future exposure will look like.